Good morning, everyone. My name is Tim Lind. I am the Global Head of Financial Regulatory Solutions for Thomson Reuters. It is a real distinct honor to be moderating the first session on the first day of Cybos. We were wondering who would show up at 9 o'clock on the first day of Cybos. So obviously a very eager and ambitious audience. Either that or you probably work for one of these gentlemen and they ordered you to be here. <laughs> we don't care as long as you're here, so welcome. Uh, I'd also like to thank Swift. Uh, Cybos is the best planned, best produced, best executed event in our industry without question. And the teams that go on behind the scenes uh, work hard and deserve a lot of accolades. So I, I do want to thank Swift for the opportunity to be here. Um, I also have a, a, a really strong panel today. Um, I wish we could have done this session maybe at a big plenary. I think you'll, you'll, you'll agree. Um, it's difficult for me as a moderator uh, with only 45 minutes to ask you know, the kind of questions that I want to ask within that time frame. I had a university professor that said about stupid questions. Are there, are there, and there's no stupid questions. He's like, yeah, there's no stupid questions. There's just stupid people that ask them. So I'm a little nervous there. Um, so I want to I want to cover a few things here When we look at our professional career, it's like flying in a balloon We all want to see whatever we can see. We want to travel great distances. We want to see how high we can go But it doesn't always work out that way. Sometimes we fall down it leaves us two options either we figure out how to create more heat innovation how to create new value new products and services to from the top keep us high Sometimes that doesn't work. The other option is, how do we lighten our load? How do we throw things from the basket? Which is never a pleasant thing. Um, we find out in that situation what's truly valuable to us, you know, what we really rely on. And I think those are the type of themes from how do we grow on the top, how do we manage cost, and what's really important to us from the bottom. It's been a rough seven or eight years in this business, but we haven't hit the ground yet. So we're lucky, we're lucky to be here and there's a lot of optimism and I want to explore a lot of that. So there's three points we want to make in this session. We want to talk about what are the primary economic and structural changes that are impacting the security services industry. We want to talk about what leading banks are doing about it, what ICSDs are doing about it, the strategies they're employing to react to these changes and to take it to the next level. Uh, we also want to share with you an outlook, why, to be, why you should be optimistic to be in this business. So I'd like to introduce my speakers today. Um, I'm not gonna go through their biographies. Uh, that would probably kill all of our time considering the professional accolades and achievements that they've, that they've uh, managed to accomplish. Uh, I thought I was doing well in my business, but it's pretty humbling to sit next to these guys, I gotta tell you. Um, so first, I want to start with uh, my immediate left, Mr. William Mack. Uh, William is the uh, ex executive vice president and head of the Asia Pacific region for the Northern Trust. To his left, an old friend of mine taught me everything I know about outsourcing, uh, Jose Placido. He is the global head of client development and strategy for BNP Paribas. Uh, to his left, in the middle, Marc Robert Nicou. He is the chief executive of Clearstream and represents the ICSD perspective here. To his left, Chris Rowland. Chris is the managing director, investor services at JP Morgan. And finally, Sethinder Singh is, is the global head of institutional cash and security services for Deutsche Bank. So I'd like to welcome the panelists. In terms of a, a few themes we want to go through, so this whole macroeconomic change, um, intraday liquidity <laughs> pooling, uh, negative interest rates, um, certainly a, a focus on asset safety and transparency, uh, changes in our investor demographics and demands of our clients, uh, new global allocation strategies, cybersecurity financial crime, massive re-regulation of this industry, both well-intentioned and completely misguided. Um, how do we deal with infrastructural obsolescence? You know, how do we use new technologies to uh, complement what we do? So there, there are a lot of challenges this industry is facing. Um, collaboration and partnership 
is obviously a key theme of Cybos. Um, the whole notion of competition versus reciprocity for these gentlemen and their businesses is a fascinating concept for me. We're all customers and we're all competitors. We sleep in the same room, but we sleep with one eye open all the time, right? Um, we have to satisfy our clients' insatiable need to grow, our need to grow. Um, ultimately, these gentlemen get paid to tear down walls, to reduce the friction, to bring clarity, uh, and ultimately allow capital to flow like water. That's the, that's the mandate of the security services world. Um, so I want everyone as a leader on this panel um, to talk about their, their vision. These are leaders, they offer clarity, they offer inspiration, they offer a view of the future. So I wanna, I wanna explore that for sure. I also want them to tell us what we should be paying attention to at Cybos this, Cybo this year. So without further ado, Chris, I wanna start with you. So in, in your estimation, and, and J.P. Morgan's view, what are some of the key macroeconomic forces that are having the, business, the, the, the biggest impact on your business? Uh, and, and really with a view on the security services angle. If you could start, please. Thanks, Tim, and good morning to everyone. Um, so when I think about the, the biggest macro trends, there's two areas I'd pick out. The first is around actually the fundamentals for growth are actually fairly solid at the moment. We have the highest levels of assets under custody we've had since 2008, they're coming in at around about $80 trillion. We have governments who need to fund country deficits and pension deficits, all of which are trigger growth in the securities industry. And there is wider access to global investment products than there's ever been before in terms of Latin America, this region, Asia, and all around the world. So the fundamentals are actually sound. The second thing I'd pick out on, and it echoes some of Tim's original opening points is around what society and the regulators are at, in general are looking to achieve. And those goals all come back down to the fundamental soundness of this industry. So right here at Cyboss 2015, we're in the midst of rollout of GSIP, Basel III. Uh, we have rules around asset safety, um, around investor protections. All those things are aimed at one outcome, and that is really understanding the fundamental risk environment in which we operate and making sure that we keep that as riskless as possible whilst at the same time we are trying to achieve this, this objective around growth. So there is, a, there is a balance view in terms of opportunities for growth but tempered with how do we make sure that we remain safe and secure and that our investors are confident that they have an, a um, sound environment in which to invest in. So Tim, back to you. Thank you, Chris. Seth Vinder, I'm going to go to you next. I, a, similar, a similar question, how are you seeing from a very global perspective uh, the impact of some of these key trends I listed off, changes in investor demographics, how is it impacting your business? So I think from a, from a business perspective, the, the, uh, the one-liner that we've always used is how do you grow and de-risk at the same time? So you've got both ends of the spectrum happening. You're trying to increase your revenue and you're also trying to make, um, as, as Chris said, efficiencies, look at the bottom line, look at what you're running the business and how you're running it. So huge opportunity. So I'll start with some of the challenges that we're seeing as an industry. And I think the security services industry, uh, if you take a step back, uh, and most of us are intrinsically involved in it, so it is difficult to take a step back. But if you take a step back and look at the industry over the last seven years, 10 years, 15 years, some of the things we faced are pretty unique and, and what I would say the perfect storm in terms of what the industry is facing. So just to recognize that, to see how we're coping with it is hugely important. So you look at interest rates, you look at margin compression, you look at fee compression, you look at increased competition, you look at regulation, you look at the impact of disruptive technology, and then you look at the infrastructure changes happening. All of that is happening at the same time. So they're not sequential, they're happening in parallel. Mm. At the same time, the expectation is we will continue to invest in the business, we'll continue to grow, <coughs> we'll continue to be more centric to our clients than we've ever been. And that, I think, is, is the perfect balancing act. How do you ensure you remain relevant to your clients? How do you move fast enough in a very, very volatile environment and yet have the controls in place not to give up on anything so there's no slippage on the investment on the infrastructure side. So what you're putting on the infrastructure side is stability, scalability, 
and then efficiency around it. So it's, it's an amazing balancing act, and all of us play it, but getting that balance right, hugely important. You could walk away being very negative, or you could walk away being hugely optimistic without actually recognizing the risks that the business inherently has and not managing it adequately. Excellent, thank you. I want to take it to the, to the, the Asian uh, theater here. And every time I come to Singapore, I'm always fascinated how fast everything moves, how fast they can separate me from my money. I mean, there's a lot of money to be made here and a lot of, uh, a lot of action. So William, I, I want you to comment on what's going on in Asia? What are some of the important trends? How are banks working together in this, in this region? Sure, thanks, Tim. And good morning, everybody. Um, but just to follow up with what Savinda said about you know, the challenges, the perfect storm, and, and, and the macro, economic, and financial landscape we're all, challenge, uh, we're all facing. I think for us, what is important then is for each of the financial institution and Northern Trust is no, no, no difference. Um, to, be, to be able to, to know what is your core, what, is, you know, what, what do you do best? Uh, and I think you know, we have seen financial institutions having to um, um, leave behind some of the, the more volatile, less core businesses and concentrating on the core businesses that they can do well. So I think that is where we, how we are approaching it from Northern Trust. And, and definitely if you look at the Asian clients and the markets that we have seen in the last seven, eight years post-crisis, uh, um, this continued increase for essentially one key area, which is data. Um, you know, whether you can, you can, you can um, um, settle the trades quickly. Ultimately, from the clients that we have, what is important to them is to be able to have very um, quick information on their trade settlements, their securities, holdings, and not just quick, but also accurate. So accuracy, timeliness are two very important um, uh, factors. Uh, and increasingly so in the last several years, the, the security of those data, making sure that those data, uh, whenever we, we touch them, hold them, uh, and, and process them for our clients, it's important that we have a very secure environment around it. Um, and increasingly, because of you know, the challenges that Servinda uh, talked about in, in, the, in the markets, our clients are faced with the challenge of low interest rates, um, volatility in the market, and therefore they need good data to help them to manage the risk better, to be able to have um, uh, more informed investment decisions. And I think as a service provider, as a security service provider, uh, it is really the, the main um, focus, uh, even call it, that we are, we are you know, spending our time on day in, day out. Excellent. And Jose, I want to go to you in a similar way. So a lot of concepts of transparency, asset safety has come up in the discussion from the panelists so far. So in, in terms of transparency disclosure requirements, um, how are custodians like BNP helping clients with new services to <coughs> offer that type of transparency? And William mentioned data. How are you helping them getting the data together and, and, and coping with this yeah. type of disclosure? Could you comment on that? Yeah, I, I, think, I think we are uniquely positioned to deal with the data challenges of our clients. I mean, we are, um, as uh, was mentioned before, uh, if you have a strong, resilient, stable, underlying infrastructure and system, uh, it starts with, obviously, regulating. regulators are asking our clients for disclosure rules uh, more often in split in, in many, many ways. So I think we need to look at data in, a, in what I call more interactive manner. I think we're all used to sending reports month end, weekend, I think the world has changed pretty dramatically and having much more of an inter interactive platform in order to manage intraday risk or uh, end of day risk uh, weekly, depending on what the client's requiring. Uh, if you look at the regulatory rules by industry, if you take a look at Solvency 2, for example, we're in a, a really great position to provide reporting so there is much better, um, you know, what I call balance sheet uh, efficiency. So I think the rules of the game have changed from what I call regulatory compliance to how do I manage my business better? And I think we can't do it alone. I think we have to co-create with our clients. If we look at uh, an example with a, a very large superannuation fund in Australia, the whole ESG reporting has been top of, uh, top of the, the page. We've actually partnered with Reuters with one of their um, data um, repositories that allow us to, to give out uh, risk, uh, risk analytical operational type of data in a much more interactive manner. And I think that's the route to go. And I think that's the new, 
what I call um, threshold of choosing providers. Right. Um, it, it is really the ability to provide data in a more timely manner and efficient, an efficient manner. So it's the, the custodian, you know, calling it a custodian I think is an anachronism because obviously it's, we don't do cuss anymore, but providing data to your clients for investment decision support, you mentioned analytics. Can you just expand on that a little? What kind of information, what kind of analytics? I, I'm not going to use the term big data, but I'm sure you're going to hear a lot of that this week. Yeah. Um, but would you comment, like, yeah, what yeah, other we kind, of we kind of look at the smart data. We have, we have something called a data navigator um, uh, analytic, analytics tool. And, and basically, um, we populate the information, uh, the underlying information, and also, actually also supplement information that may be custodied with other custodians. And the idea is to uh, really tailor uh, the information to how the underlying investor um, uh, wants us to tailor it. And I think it, it gets difficult because we're also dealing with how their customers, customers require data. So right now, I think that's probably our largest investment is to ensure that we can deploy um, this level of, of data requirements in a much more useful way. So, you know, pricing this thing becomes difficult, but it, it does engage you with your more strategic clients that are looking to outsource some of the things they need to invest in that we take on our, ourselves. So the level of, one of the challenges is the level of competency, the, the type of employees you're hiring are very different than the employee, the more traditional, what I call after the fact analytics. So it's not uh, month-end uh, performance, but it's, it's a lot more what I call indicative performance based on what they want to see. Okay. Uh, Mark, I want to get you in, into this here now. As we look at the supply chain of information and how it flows from you know, investor to custodian to depository, how are ICSDs expanding their, their remit in terms of how they process trades or provide information, et cetera, and, and opening up new markets too for, for, their, for their participants. Can you comment on that? Sure. I, I think it goes back to what uh, to some of the remarks have said in there. In terms of us being able to, to do this balancing act, I think one of the key uh, compass in doing so is, is customer centricity, right? The ability to know where your customer want to move, the type of services that they need. Some of them are changing based on the regulatory environment. Some of them are changing based on the amount of, uh, of cost pressure that, uh, that uh, is impacting the banks. I think when, when I look at the uh, dynamic with our customers, and it's true, you mentioned that we have a fairly incestuous environment when it comes to relationships uh, between banks and, and, uh, and ICSDs and different types of banks, uh, what I see evolving is, 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 uh, is the pace. It's much quicker. We're all trying to find a source of growth. Um, and for us, it means something slightly different than for our customers, but ultimately, we, we look in the same places. Uh, Asia it was mentioned before. I, I think for us, China, you, you refer to our role as an ICSD. Well, one of our roles is to bring certain markets to the international, mar to the international market, to give access to international investors to the Chinese market. And, and I think this is, uh, this is something that has been long in the making. We've seen an offshore uh, market develop uh, over the years. I think 2010 is when um, we started to provide some of the, of the offshore Remimbi settlement services. Um, but this is a fixed pool and um, of, I guess, somewhat limited interest to, uh, to, to, to the wider community. And it's, it's not dealing in China. It's dealing in a quota type of system. Now China is opening up uh, at a slower pace than some would like, but I think this is where we need to be. That's the role of the ICSDs in that, in that sphere, is to be able to come into that market and offer an environment where others can then join. Um, the same, and I go back to the, uh, to the remark, you, your introductory remark, you, you know, we need to, to, to find avenues of growth, and they're not all geographical. I mean, some of them are about um, what do we do in Europe? Uh, I, I saw Jean-Michel earlier and some of the ECB people. I, I think there's a, there's a certain amount of, of expectation with T2S at the moment. And I think this is something that we can leverage in Europe. Can we, are we able to take the opportunities of T2S to change maybe the dynamic between the banks uh, and between the CSDs in order to, to create a new environment that is more efficient, um, that is uh, ultimately bringing capital markets benefit? allowing investors to invest uh, in more uh, types of companies at a, in better conditions and allowing issuers to get more funding, which is, I guess, some of the capital market union discussions that we'll have in the, in the coming, uh, maybe in this panel or in the coming ones. Right, right. Chris, I want to come back to you now. Um, we heard a little, com some comments from Jose about 
the, the, the providing data, the clients mentioned things like Solvency 2 and more and more information they need in, in, in real time or near time. Um, in the whole concept of risk and transparency, how do you see JP Morgan and, and your industry in general changing their role in how they deal with your asset management clients? What kind of new things are you going to do? So I actually think there's been a fundamental shift in the way this, this industry operates. Um, and that shift is, I think, really been looking at ourselves as a service provider, um, a process, business process provider, and the shift is back to being a risk manager. And that's really something that's been driven by a lot of the regulation we see at the moment. Um, and what it means to be a risk manager, I think, actually means there's a concentration of risks within the custodian chain that historically has never been completely transparent. So if you look at regulations like USITs and AFMDs that affect, directly affect my client base, you know, they now look at the depository function, the custodial function, as something they can use to sell in terms of the strength of institution that backs their funds. That's a, that's a clear change that comes alongside USITs 5 regulation, which clearly calls out the, the need for liability or custodian state liability for their agent risk and insolvency risk that could be faced by their funds at any given point in time. So that's a real shift our clients are seeing, um, and it's something that we're having to respond to. It's also coming from the other direction as well. I think there is a, given the regulatory drive to de-risk, um, from a core infrastructure perspective, there is a real requirement now to keep that as riskless as possible. So things like CSDR set a clear framework in which CSDs are operating. And again, that's shifting risk back into the custodian chain and how the custodians operate day to day to manage risk. And then the final point in terms of my opening comments I made as well was around the, what we're now seeing in terms of the balance sheet, the scarce resource of the balance sheet and the potential for costs of the use of that balance sheet to start to be passed back into the client base. And that is a real new thing that's come along in, in, in recent months, which makes it very transparent to our clients as to when they are actually leaving deposits with us, how much that's going to cost them, the types of deposits that we think are viable and therefore useful, those that are not. And also then there's a knock-on impact of that, which potentially is coming down the line as well, which is around credit and the degree to which uh, this industry um, really oils the wheels of how we um, achieve secure and safe settlement by injection of credit and liquidity into the business model. And ultimately, I think that is something that also is going to be more transparent to clients, and potentially that cost ultimately can end up being passed on to clients as well. Okay. Now, a couple. Re I'm cautious not to get into a regulatory discussion because we'll go down a hole we never crawl out of. But just at a high level, Seth Ender, I, I want to go to you. What we heard about AFMD, Solvency Two. Are there are there specific regulations? that are causing your clients and yourself the most difficulty? What are they and what are you doing about them? So I think you could answer that question and I could easily take up the remaining 24 minutes <laughs> and much more. Just going, listing the, uh, the, the regulatory landscape and the number of regulatory um, initiatives that are impacting the business, right? And we went through this exercise a couple of years back and we said, can we try to list out everything that's impacting the security services business? and we had a multiple page spreadsheet in font size six. And that wasn't fun because there's lots and lots of things that are happening that could impact uh, our clients from a regulatory perspective. And I think we've mentioned a few of them from a, from a high level perspective. I think if I could just try to take that question slightly differently, which is what's, what does that really mean from a client perspective, right? Yeah. Um, so we could sit here and, and predict doomsday very quick, easily and say 500 regulations um, and each one isn't necessarily coordinated. So not all regulations are pointing north. Some are north, some are northeast, some are east. I'd even dare to say some are south, right? So they contradict each other depending on where they come from and they're not globally coordinated. What does that mean from a provider perspective? What does it mean from a, from a user perspective, a client perspective? And I think that's where our industry has and needs to continue doing what we're doing right now, which is changing the tone of the conversation with clients and the tone of the conversation isn't necessarily about providing a product solution, right? We provide custody, we provide asset servicing, we provide cash services. We've actually changed that into a thematic conversation with clients because that's what they struggle with. Surprisingly, a lot of our clients look like ourselves. They're financial institutions. They're struggling with the same things we're struggling with. So the conversation isn't about a small piece 
of a bigger pie. The conversation is about themes, and the themes are liquidity, balance sheet, risk, collateral. Right. And the ability to put a piece of fund services with a cash solution, with a custody, with a lending part, put all of that together, put it in front of the client, that's where this industry needs to really get to. Because the day of selling a simple custody solution or a cash solution, they're long gone. Right. Clients don't want that because the clients that we're talking to are wanting complex solutions to complex problems because the world around them is very different. Right. Love it. Uh, William, I want to come to you too. Ex-banker, a central banker, part of the regulatory? Long ago. Long ago, sorry, we won't hold you accountable for that. They're good <laughs> people too. Um, any, any comments about the whole impact of regulation, maybe how technology is going to help cope with some of this transparency or disclosure requirements? Mm. You know, what, what, maybe, as, uh, maybe take a step back in your old role, the intent of some of the regulation and, and how we partner maybe with regulators, how you work more proactively with community. Sure. Can you comment on that? Sure. So this is off the record. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, maybe 20 years ago, when I was still a young central banker uh, in the region, and there were a lot of um, discussions both locally and also with um, other central banks in the region with regards to the model that Europe has, you know, the, 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 uh, the monetary union, not just trade, not just securities transaction, uh, you know, one single currency. And at that point in time, um, you know, the only way we thought that this could happen in Asia is that you need political will. And 20 years ago, you know, the kind of prediction was, well, maybe in the next 50 years it will happen. But obviously in the last 10 years, I think what we have seen in <coughs> Asia Pacific, there's a lot of political will. Um, and, you know, political um, um, uh, decisions will, will drive a lot of the, even if you argue that central bankers are uh, independent, but to the extent that if this increases the um, infrastructure, be it payments, settlement, um, capital markets, infrastructure in the region, if this is also in line with what the central banks are also trying to develop, I think that you know, central banking uh, expertise plus the political will, they do come together. And so I think what we have seen in the last, especially in the last two, three years with all these stock connects and, and the fund passports, whether this is in Southeast Asia, North Asia, Northeast Asia, uh, I think these are just a start. Would it take time um, for them to you know, eventually become very efficient mechanisms? I think it will. Uh, obviously, for example, tax, different tax regimes is an area where uh, walls have to be torn down so that you have a lot of harmonization. I think that will happen. It will take time, but it will happen. Um, so I think technology does play a, uh, take, uh, you know, play a very important part in enabling um, such um, collaboration and such um, uh, objectives to, to happen and to be realized. And so as service provider, we do have a lot of uh, opportunities to work with central banks um, in, you know, to, to facilitate these developments in the region. Right. I, any advice on how bankers deal with regulators and engage one another? I, it, you know, we all want the same thing. We want asset safety. We get hurt more than anybody in a, any sort of market downturn. Any advice on how to... For a start, it's good to be an ex-central banker. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, but but, but on, <laughs> on a more serious note, I think it's all about transparency. Um, and you know, I'm sure my, my co-panelists can also comment on that. But it's a lot about transparency and building the trust in the right. relationship. And we know these things take time. Right. It doesn't happen overnight. So That's what we're trying to get. Uh, Jose, I want to, want to come back to you here. We, you know, we did talk... It's obligatory that we mentioned big infrastructure changes like, like T2S, right? And that changes the relationship between agent banks in Europe and the ICSDs. So I want to cover that topic, if we will, because we got Mark here too, and it would, I'd be remiss to not cover it. So what kind of relationship changes or dynamics does T2S impose? I think like anything else, I think it starts with your, knowing your client, and the clients are pretty well, they're extremely sophisticated. They've analyzed uh, their operating models and, um, you know, what kind of decisions um, we're involved in. It's an engagement, it's a dialogue. We've been in the process along with, with uh, some of my colleagues here for, for a few years. We, we've been at the forefront of the T2S uh, changes where you know, we've started, uh, they're, they're alive and well, started in Italy not too long ago. And most of the conversations really depend on what the client 
what model they want to use. And the level of flexibility that we can engage in that will determine uh, our relationship with them. Some will go direct to the ISD, uh, ICSD, um, you know, have an account operating model. Others will engage more with us, and, and the relationship with ICSD won't be as direct. And I think it really depends on, on the institution. But I think for once, the post-trade environment will have a sense of harmonization. I think we can move to the capital markets uh, union in Europe. Um, I think the, the clients are making decisions to consolidate their agent network. Uh, you know, once they choose their provider, they'll have that single gateway. Um, all of that, they are, they're very familiar. At the end of the day is, you know, they're make, going to make a decision of who they want to partner with, who do they want to build the operating model. It goes way beyond the, the technicalities. There's a lot of great firms out there that have invested a lot of, of money, such as ourselves. Um, and it's a question of who can provide uh, not just a T2S model, but liquidity uh, answers, uh, auto collateralization, more efficient use of collateral, and, and the infrastructure to keep investing in this, in this model. So I, I think it's, uh, if, you don't, if you haven't built a, a collaborative, engaging relationship with your clients uh, before the T2S, it's hard to engage during the T2S. So I think it, this has evolved into a much more business-to-business -business discussion than just a, a regulatory change. Okay. Now, Mark, I want to get your comment on this, too. And there's always been sort of an, an awkward relationship, I think, between banks and, and CSDs. You know, you, you use the word incestuous, we're an incestuous business, but it seems like, it, it's like hanging out with a tribe of cannibals, you know? When, when, when things are good, it's fun and games, but when we get hungry, we tend to eat each other a little bit. So, uh, how, is, how do we look at ICSDs and your ambitions to grow alongside of that of, you know, the big banks here on the panel? How do we manage that? How do we conceptualize that relationship? I don't know, Jose showed me his teeth when you said that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the T2, you know, T2S is probably an interesting input to, to, to answer that question because it, it, it changes, um, it, it, uh, it offers some very powerful functionalities that are there to those who want them. You don't have to take them. You can decide that they don't matter to your business as a banker, that your type of uh, your business model will not benefit from autocall, or that it will not benefit from a single point of entry to all European markets. Or you can decide that this is key to to um, to, to your strategy in Europe, and, and different degrees. And different companies have uh, have gone to different levels of analysis and sophistication in this. And I think now with Wave One. Uh, being live, people see that they need to make decisions now. So I think when you ask, when times get you know, challenging, uh, you know, how do we each find our space? I, I think you, you can see that in the last two years, people have tried to, to occupy different spaces. So we've had new entrants to the CSD world, which is not something that we've had in a very, very long time. Actually, T2S was expected to reduce the number of CSDs, and the first, uh, the first thing that happened in terms of market uh, changes was more CSDs. Um, some of them were independent, some of them were actually the bank solution to position themselves to, to T2S. Um, I think that is, well, it turns out that these, these ventures have not all fared very well, and I think it goes back to uh, something that, that is quite core to our industry, which is, some call it the uh, power of inertia, uh, some call it, you know, just a perfect system already being in place, <laughs> we, you know, and so somewhere in between <coughs> there is the idea that the ICSD, the place of the CSDs, the custodians, the, the, the different players in that market, I've, I've created a value chain, and that value chain is very powerful for all markets and for all players in it. Which is why, and I don't know if, if we're going to go into a, a new technology type of discussion, I think we should think of new technologies also in that term. We have a, we have a well-functioning industry. Yes, it can be more efficient. Yes, we can, we can use new technology to make it more efficient. But we, we need to recognize that you know, the industry has made a lot of effort over the years to be a safe, stable infrastructure that ultimately holds people's money. Uh, and I think that's something that we need to keep in mind when we look at our respective space in this industry. Where are we credible? Where are we not? Uh, and how can we best serve customers in, in, uh, in, in that setup? Okay. Uh, Seth Vindo, I want to ask you a similar question. So as you, Mark mentioned value chain and the different th ways that, you know, someone like Deutsche would add value to its clients. Are you, with T2S, looking at things 
that you're gonna wanna do differently and how did that, does that impact your overall value chain and what you provide and what you think should be utilitized? How, how do you approach that? So I think if you take a step back on T2S and look at it from an industry perspective, and I'll give you the Deutsche Bank one as well, I think it's, it's been the catalyst for change in the way we approach both what we do and what we position in front of our clients. Uh, so the historical model of we do everything end to end, here's a simple solution, clients buy that, is long gone. Because the way the buying behavior for Target 2 for securities is happening is a very bifurcated model. Uh, on one hand, you have everything remains the same. The agent bank plays a critical role end to end to the complete opposite end of the spectrum where a client says, I don't need an agent bank for the majority of the services. I will connect directly and potentially do my own corporate actions and whatever else. So you've got two ends of the spectrum. In between, I would provocatively say that there aren't two or three steps, they're like 10 different steps. And that suddenly made all of us sit up and listen and say, oh, that means there isn't a one solution that we can provide our clients. It means there are multiple solutions we can provide or need to provide our clients. So we've actually had to look quite deep in the way we look at our business and actually had to change our mindset. I think it was Lars Seibos when I said this, We've actually gone from a Deutsche perspective, looked at it and said, as much as we'd like to be an end-to-end -end service provider to a client, we need to break this model up. We need an open architecture system. We need the ability for our clients to plug and play. So we've, uh, we've won a large mandate last year. We announced it just before Cybos. Uh, and, and that model was a very, very different model to the one we had envisaged when we had started bidding for it. It was very different to the one that actually ended up, where we are collaborating with an ICSD to provide a solution to a client. Now, if you go back five years, that notion of collaborating with an ICSD, we're supposed to be competing or using them. Right. So that notion and that whole way of looking at your business needs to change. Because I'd much rather collaborate and win something than lose it by insisting on everything has to be with me. And that notion in our industry, I think, is quickly catching up, and we need to. We need to be smart. And I think uh, somebody on the panel said, you know, we need to define where you add value. And you also need to define where your clients think you add value. They're ready to pay for that. But if the infrastructure or connectivity isn't where they think you add value, then that's not something you should be investing money in. So we've clearly defined where we think our clients want us to add value. So a certain bunch of clients will want everything that we do. Others will want more flexibility, and I think as an industry, we've got to listen to our clients, have that open architecture. It goes against the grain of what we've grown up believing we should do, but that's the only way we will survive, from my perspective. Okay. And the whole point of collaboration and partnership, Chris, I want to ask you that a question related to that. You know, how are you looking at all of the activities you need, all the technology, all the service provision to deliver value to your customers? How's JP Morgan figuring out what are you gonna do yourself, what do you actually add value to, versus what you're gonna delegate to third parties and seek additional support in that, that whole infrastructure supply chain? Yeah, so I, I think it's a really key question we have to address, and it, it builds on some of the points that have been made. How we choose our partners and collaborate with our partners really comes down to ultimately what does that mean we're going to deliver back to our clients as a, as a consequence of doing that. And industry level collaboration has, we obviously got the T2S example which is on the verge of looking like a very successful industry level activity. There are other things going on around the world today where collaboration has been absolutely key at an industry level. So you've got things like T plus two, legal entity identifier, where the whole industry has come together to make, to make a more transparent and open infrastructure for, for all players to participate in. And then you've got to look at are there grand schemes, grand private schemes, actually, will any of those ever become successful as well? So quite often it gets touted that should we have an asset servicing utility for the securities industry. I'm personally of the view that when you get private sector schemes like that happening, they tend to consume a lot of money and they tend to distract from what we're really trying to do, which is deliver world-class services back to our clients. So I'd much rather have a dialogue in terms of how we're interacting with partners in some of the, the points that have been made here on this panel around what are the particular services that can be um, offered and actually make value add um, decision making better for what we do as a business. 
And then secondly, how do I take that and actually deliver that back to my clients so they themselves get a better value add as well? And I think it's that type of collaboration that I see over the, over the next couple of years has been absolutely key to this industry, uh, as opposed to yet more piling of billions of dollars into massive schemes to make the world potentially a better place, but with no guarantee of success. You see spending a lot more money with vendors, Chris? A lot more money? I, I, I do. I'm sure they'd be delighted to hear me say that. But I think you have to make use of your, your wider community to interact with the service they have to offer and then make that build as part of your overall um, picture to deliver back to your clients. And I think whilst we'll obviously be um, hard on cost and price, we obviously want to take more service and actually give a better, give a better product back to them. Yeah, I deal with your contract people. You are hard on price, I can tell you that for sure. But uh, <laughs> the, the whole point of... Um, and, and William, I want to kind of ask you a similar question around not just T2S, but the, the, the relationships between banks and depositories. And is this a model that Asia is, is looking after? Is there that type of collaboration in, in, in this region? What, what, what's the thought of T2S and those kind of models here in Asia? No, I think what is happening in Europe on T2S is certainly very important for us in Asia. Um, and I think, that the, as uh, Savinda mentioned, um, it's all about you know, harmonizing efficiency. Um, so I think we're all looking at very keenly what is happening in Europe. Um, and, and I think um, it can be done in Asia Pacific, um, you know, to the point I earlier mentioned about the political will, the cooperation among the, the regulators in, in the region. Uh, I think that's really happening. So it, it, it really gives a very strong base for more things to happen. So I think it w it's a matter of timing before it happens in Asia. You see similar type of yeah, similar, similar type of constructs. Where what market will it come out of? It's going to come out of Singapore, Hong Kong, Tokyo. Well, I think um, you know the, the usual key regulators who are very keen to make sure that we have a, a very efficient um, ecosystem in, in settlements and in, in some of the uh, movement of cash and securities in the region. So the likes of Singapore, Hong Kong, and Australia in my mind will be the three key ones. Okay, makes sense. Uh, Jose, I want to turn to you in a, in a similar question. How are you looking at, you know, everyone on the panel has been pushing to some extent middle office outsourcing and other services, you know, how to delegate functions to, to you to create a low cost, uh, strong value proposition around those type of things. How, how are you using that mentality in your own business in terms of your suppliers? Well, I think uh, the first thing we, we've done, and, and I think we continue to do that, is really uh, clarity of segmenting our clients and in, in very clear terms by industry, but also by economic value and the usage of our geographical footprint, our products. I think uh, being very clear about um, at what level you start designing, developing, and delivering versus just uh, developing and deliver delivering is really important. So for our larger clients, uh, clearly uh, where uh, they're at the forefront of, of, of challenges, this is where we're having deep conversations uh, where they're much more complex, much, much more sophisticated, have uh, various legacy systems, are in themselves trying to streamline their operating model. And that's kind of the conversation. It's no longer about product, whether it's the middle office component. It really is what's their target operating model and how do we help them uh, be much more effective. So the middle office is one of many component parts in terms of achieving that. And we can't necessarily achieve that alone, going back to uh, ensuring that we've got the right vendors, the right partnership, um, and much more results focused as opposed to activity focused when we bring vendors in, because we are entrusting them with the relationships we have to help us figure out where we're going with clients. But I go back to really understanding uh, the client's operating model and what their clients, uh, their, their clients' clients are looking for as a first step. Then I think we have, uh, as a global bank, and a lot of my partners are in the same, uh, colleagues are in the same boat, then we'll offer the solutions. And for very large clients, obviously, there's an element of design or tailoring that is necessary, and it is not one size fits all, which has been uh, brought up uh, before. Okay. So, middle office is one of multitude of component parts that uh, ever expanding. Uh, ever expanded. Yeah. yeah. I, I exactly. think, can I just add it? Please, please. I think increasingly, when we talk about target operating model, it's no longer. Uh, those good interaction and discussions with the back office at, at where our clients sit. But uh, it's a lot more now involving discussions with the front office, those who are trading, making the decision on what to buy, what to sell, uh, to make sure they're involved in that target operating model discussion. I think that's very important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's a good point. 
Now, I do, underpinning all of these plugging into supply chain is a technology changes, technology disruption. Mark, I want to ask you something about that. It's obligatory. We mentioned blockchain in every panel, by the way. It's part of my moderation speaking guide. You've got to say blockchain at least one time to get your speaker fee, that is. <laughs> uh, what, are there any really disruptive technologies? In, in the age of uh, legacy you know, systems, does it, can it really change the way we do business, that kind of stuff? Well, from a personal perspective, uh, I'm a lawyer, so uh, <laughs> I, there's, uh, I will spare you any lengthy uh, explanation of blockchain because I don't understand it. <laughs> but uh, I understand the disruptive potential that it has or that it's said to have. Um, it goes back to some of the earlier discussion. To me, there's two ways. You can see something like blockchain as something that will change the environment, that will change the way the financial market fabric is, or you can see it as a technology enabler, something that you can use and that you can use probably when it comes to the financial sector in closed environments. So club-like of, of, of uh, you know, with a fixed number of users or at least a, an, an agreed and approved number of users. Uh, and, and I think in that second sense, I would say it's not disruptive in the same way that, that we would normally or that we, we may think about it. Now, I mean, on the plane I saw an article somewhere about the new rules of competition and all, and it was, you know, the first rule was be paranoid. So maybe on blockchain we need to be paranoid. Uh, and it could be that I'm sure my organization to a certain extent is <laughs> at the moment. Right. But I think it's going to take some years before we see some, some large change to the industry based on blockchain. I'm sure we're going to see some niche application. We're going to see some clever use of it. I, I remain to, to uh, I, I hope to be able to see something more fundamental, yeah, but I'm not so sure. Absolutely. We're running out of time. So before we let you gentlemen go, Sadvinder, I'm going to start with you and then come this way. Um, your, your, your advice, what should we be paying attention to at Cybos this year, first? And second, what gives us cause, cause for hope in the security services world? I think pay attention to your clients, number one. You've got almost 8,000 delegates. So if I look at it purely from a Deutsche Bank perspective, that means 7,900 clients, competitors, vendors, colleagues, friends, uh, people I will sleep in a room with one eye open or two eyes closed, I don't know. <laughs> but there's, there's a lot of people. So I think from an from a, from a opportunity perspective, yeah. this is the place to meet, talk, discuss, analyze, and, and, and try to figure out what the crystal ball really says. So that's what I would do over the next three or four days. What gives us hope? I think the fact that things are changing gives us hope, right? If, if I lived in an environment that didn't change or wasn't as volatile as it is today, and, and the conversation Mark just had about disruptive technology or enabling technology, two ends of the, uh, of the pendulum, that's what excites me. Mm -hmm. right. We're looking at opportunities and threats together. Excellent. Chris, real quick, uh, what should we look for and what's cause for hope? So look for collaboration. That's why we're all here at the end of the day. And uh, I'd echo what Satvinga said. In terms of hope, uh, there is plenty to be hopeful about. Um, if you look at the billions of dollars we've been investing in over the last five, six years to build a foundation for this industry, that will bear fruit. That is bearing fruit. And I think that is what we need to be hopeful about. It sets the right foundational platform for the future. Great, Mark. I think with such a large form of different type of people, it would be good if we are able to, to make sense of the regulatory discussion. And I'm not sure it's going to be as high on the agenda that it is that other topics will be. But I think with the capital market union statements that were made earlier this month, you can see that at least in Europe, the discussion is now moving to let's rationalize, let's make sure that we have an environment that is sane for banking to be done. And I think that's an interesting discussion that I hope we'll, we'll, we'll have. Um, and and uh, in when it comes to pure growth, I think maybe we need to be a bit less self uh, or inward looking about how we do our things and, and what are our processes. And we need to focus a bit more on how do we reach out to new markets, how do we make sure that we, we bring new assets into our machine, our collective machine. Excellent. Jose, cause for help real quick? I think, I think uh, I'll repeat getting really uh, understanding where, where, what, what the challenges of our clients are. Uh, are they similar, are they different, and what are they focusing on? I think themes like uh, industrializing our KYC or cybersecurity um, seems to be um, issues we're, uh, we're wrestling with. Uh, interested to see how others are doing. We have a lot of smart 
technolo technological firms out there uh, in, the, in the boots? How can they bridge the gap between some of the things we're seeing uh, or wrestling with with our legacy environment and figuring out what the future might look like by, by engaging them in conversations that otherwise we wouldn't be able to engage in such a condensed, uh, in condensed environment? Excellent. William? Well, very quickly, I think um, just echoing what Sabrina said, but in, in a shorter phrase, it's all about connecting and collaborating. You know, we have so many opportunities, people you know, people you don't know in, in, in the, uh, the, for the next several days. I think those are excellent opportunities to connect and to collaborate. Um, in terms of uh, challenges, you know, we talk about regulatory challenges, we talk about um, technology changes. I just want to use a Chinese phrase, Wei Qi, which means for every challenge is opportunity. Yeah. So for us, I think if we, we just look at Asia Pacific, um, certainly there are a lot of opportunities for us to, to seize. Wei Qi, we promise you some hope before we close. Okay. So. The tagline of Cybos is advanced critical dialogue. I think it's still there. We, ex we encourage you to explore the limitations of, of, that, of that statement. Be curious. Uh, what's the old cliche? Live like you'll die tomorrow. Learn like you'll live forever. So with that, I'd love to wish you a great week at Cybos. Uh, be curious. Ask a lot of questions and have a great week. Thanks for your time and attention.